Okay, I think it's uh, time to start now. Uh, today I'm going to talk about plastic deformation and also how that leads to the development of uh, texture when we deform materials by various processes. Now, there is this uh, very famous book written by Schmidt and Boas, which covers a huge amount of what we are going to do today, uh, Crystal Plasticity. It's a classic book, and you can download it freely from this website if you're interested. Uh, it goes back to the 1950s, but everything in it is still accurate. So you can download it freely from my website. Now, of course, we are interested in texture for many, many reasons. You know that uh, the ability to draw deep cans relies almost completely on the texture of the material, the control of the crystallographic texture of the material. And when I was uh, a little boy, if you bought a Coke can, it would not be drawn. It would be made from sheet, which is then welded, resistance welded along the side, and then a cap uh, attached to the top and bottom. Now, this is made of a single piece, and it is so thin that it can really cut you if you tear the material, okay? It only uh, is able, you're only able to stack these cans of coke uh, because they are pressurized. If they were not pressurized, they wouldn't be able to support the weight. And this is the reason why, you know, a tin of baked beans, for example, is not made in the same way because uh, they are, uh, the beans are under a slight vacuum and a very thin piece of metal cannot support that. Okay? So if you look at tins of baked beans, they're made from steel and not made by deep drawing in the same way as the cans of coca. And the reason why you can make these very long uh, drawing, drawn cans is basically because of crystallographic texture which controls when you get plastic instability during the drawing of the material. And you know all about formability. I mean, there's a huge amount of work going on in GIFT on formability. Again, that depends partly on the texture of the material. And there's a large group working on electrical steels where texture controls the uh, resistance and magnetic properties. So many materials the texture is the most important parameter. Now, let's think about the deformation of a single crystal. So this is a, a single crystal. And if it's a crystal, it will have anisotropic properties. So there will be particular planes on which slip happens more easily than on other planes. And similarly, there'll be particular directions on which slip happens more easily. So a slip plane usually is the most densely packed plane in the crystal. And the reason why it's the most densely packed plane is, you know, if you've got spheres which are touching each other, then the next layer doesn't sink into that underlying layer. So if it doesn't sink, it can glide easily over that layer. Whereas if there's a lot of space between atoms, then the layer on top sinks into the underlying layer, and then it's quite difficult to slip. So generally speaking, Slip planes will be close back planes, and close back directions are the slip directions because the displacement along a close back direction is small. If the atoms are spaced further apart, then the displacement is large, and the larger the displacement, the more difficult it is to slip. So in, uh, for example, uh, austenite, the slip plane will be the 111 plane, okay, which is the close back plane, and the slip direction will be the 110 direction, which is the close back direction. And in ferrite, you don't actually have a slip, uh, ha have a close back plane. The closest back plane is the 110 plane. And in that plane, you have the 111 as the close back directions. So when I apply a stress to this crystal, there will be many possible orientations of the slip plane and slip direction because supposing it's one on one then we've got four different possibilities for one on one planes you know the one on one bar one 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 bar one one and one one bar one and within those planes there are slip directions so you take all that together there are 24 possible orientations of slip combinations of slip plane and slip direction <coughs> 
So when I apply a stress, I need to know which is the slip system, that means a combination of slip plane and slip direction, which will operate. So this is a force, and let's assume that we've got a slip plane, which is inclined at an angle phi to the force. Okay? So this is the normal to the plane makes an angle phi to the force, and the slip direction here makes an angle lambda with the tensile axis. What is the area of this slip plane given by if the cross-sectional area is A? Any ideas? Because, you know, we want to work out which is the slip system which will have the largest shear stress, okay? And stress means we have to divide the force by the area. So what's the area of this plane? A divided by cos phi, okay? And we can work out, therefore, the stress on this plane if we know the shear in that direction. So if we resolve the force along the slip direction, then that's F cos lambda. And I divide F cos lambda by this area to get the shear stress here. So F cos lambda over A divided by cos phi and rearrange that equation, we get the shear stress along this direction is F cos lambda cos phi divided by A, and this is known as the Schmid factor. You know that book that I pointed out to you, Schmid and Boas, yeah? This is the Schmid of that book. And this, the larger this value is, the more likely that slip plane will operate when you apply the force, okay? So, the system that will operate will be the one which will have the largest Schmidt factor. So I'm going to represent the process now on a stereographic projection. So remember, this is the force. This is the normal to the slip plane, and this is the slip direction. So imagine that this is the slip plane. Then this is the normal to that plane. Okay? And this is the direction along which slip will happen. And when I do the projections on the equatorial plane, it looks like this. So this is the trace of the slip plane in the upper hemisphere, and this is the trace of the slip plane in the lower hemisphere. This is the orientation of the tensile axis. This is the direction along which slip happens, and this is the normal to the slip plane. Okay? So the angle between the normal and the force is phi, and the angle between the force and the shear direction is lambda. Okay, so that's just a stereographic representation of slip in a single crystal. Now, an interesting thing is, if you take a pack of cards and you shear them, okay, that's exactly the sort of thing that happens when you deform a single crystal. So this is our single crystal. I've applied a force along here. Because I displaced the pack of cards, the orientation of the tensile axis will rotate. And the amount of rotation here is given by the original vector f plus uh, a value alpha times s, where s is a unit vector along the shear direction, and alpha is the amount of shear that we put in. So it's obvious that f dash is equal to the force plus a vector here, which is a unit vector s multiplied by the amount of shear that we put in. So when we apply a force to the single crystal, the actual, uh, when we shear the crystal, the force axis will rotate, okay? Now remember that when we do such an experiment, we're not actually doing that, right? We put our single crystal in a tensile specimen and we are pulling it. So the force axis is not allowed to rotate, right? It's constrained to move along the vertical axis. So instead, the crystal itself will rotate. Yeah? So it's a relative motion that's important. So if you can find the force axis to be constant, then the crystal planes uh, will actually rotate. This is a real single crystal, and you can see slip planes, slip directions, etc. in a real single crystal. This is again from Schmidt and Boas. It's for a zinc crystal. So. If I plot my stereogram in the axes of the crystal, then we see that the force is moving. And if I just go back to the previous slide, 
the direction in which the force moves uh, to the new position F dashed, F and S all lie in the same plane, yeah? Because F dashed is equal to F plus S. And I've explained to you many times that if you have two vectors, you can generate a third by a linear combination of those two vectors, yeah? Therefore, F, F dash and S all lie in the same plane. So the direction in which F dash rotates is along the great circle defined by F and S. So it's on the plane formed by F and S, okay? That's the direction in which uh, the force axis moves. Is everyone happy with that? Yeah. If we write an equation that F dash equals F plus S, then necessarily F dash, F and S must lie in the same plane, right? Okay, uh, so this is an illustration now of the slip systems in body-centered cubic and face-centered cubic crystals. And the dark lines indicate the slip planes and the red dots indicate the slip directions. So I mentioned to you that in body-centered cubic we don't actually have a closed back plane, but the 110 plane is the most densely packed plane okay, here. So that's the easy slip plane. And the 111 direction is a closed back plane, so the atoms are touching along that direction. So it's the smallest displacement distance, and therefore that's the easy slip direction. And notice that the slip direction lies in the slip plane. Okay, so the dot product between these two is zero. Yeah. Now, in the case of uh, the FCC uh, austenite, uh, the slip planes are now the 111 planes. These are traces of the 111 planes, and these are traces of the 110 planes here. So the close back plane is 111, and the close back directions in the FCC crystal are the 11, uh, sorry, are the 110 type directions. Now, supposing that um, I set I set N, F, and S to be on the same plane. Then I can calculate the Schmidt factor as a function of orientation, just for illustration purposes. So instead of cos lambda cos phi, I'm now writing cos phi cos 90 minus 5. Okay? Then you can see that the Schmidt factor is at a maximum at 45 degrees. Okay? So when the slip direction and the slip plane are roughly at 45 degrees to the tensile axis, they will be the most stressed slip system. And this leads us to a nice construction, which is known as Deal's Rule, which I'll illustrate shortly. Uh, in order to understand Deal's Rule, bear in mind that the slip direction must lie in the slip plane, and that the maximum shear stress occurs at about 45 degrees, okay? When, when phi and lambda are approximately 45 degrees. Right, so here is my stereographic projection. And we are uh, looking at a cubic F, uh, face-centered cubic lattice. And I can divide my stereographic projection into these 24 stereographic <coughs> triangles, and on each uh, triangle, I have a zero, zero, 001 type axis, a cube edge. At one corner, I have a close back plane, 111. And at the other, th the third corner, we have a close back direction, 101. So all these stereographic triangles are crystallographically e equivalent. They have a zero, zero, 001, a 110, and a 111 at each corner. Okay? Now, supposing that I place my tensile axis, the orientation of the tensile axis over here, uh, then I need, uh, I want to find which is the slip system that is going to operate first. That means, on which slip system do I have the largest shear stress? Okay. So we've got a close back uh, uh, direction here and a close back plane here, and this is my tensile axis, but. You know, the angle between this and this is about 54 degrees, between this and this is 45. So the angles here are going to be quite small, right? <coughs> Compared with 45. 
So those are not the directions or planes which are going to be highly stressed. I've got to move to a neighboring triangle to find the directions and uh, planes which are more stressed. So supposing I take my tensile axis and I look at the nearest 101, that isn't going to be the most stressed shear direction. So I go to the next nearest one, which is 011. Okay. Now, if that is the slip direction, then the slip plane has to be at 90 degrees to that. Okay. So again, I go to the nearest slip plane. That isn't going to be the highly stressed one. And I go to a slip plane, which is at 90 degrees to that. Okay. So any, any slip plane lying on here would be fine, but that wouldn't be any good because that makes a very large angle with the tensile axis. Okay. So we've satisfied all the qualitative conditions that I told you, that the angle between the slip direction, slip plane, should be about 45 degrees yeah, to get the maximum Schwitt factor, and that the slip direction must lie in the slip plane. So you can see the dot product between this and this is zero. Okay. So it is generally true that if I place my tensile axis in any one of these stereographic triangles, I go to the nearest slip direction and reflect it through the side of the triangle. That gives me the slip direction. Similarly, I do that and reflect it through the opposite side and I get my slip plane. So the slip system in this case, which is most highly stressed, is the one bar one one plane and the zero one one direction. That will have the largest Schmidt factor. Okay, is everybody happy with that construction? Okay, so here is another tensile orientation, tensile axis orientation. It's along the one, two, three that I'm stressing the crystal. So again, I go to the nearest slip direction, reflect it through the opposite. This will be my slip direction, which is most highly stressed. And similarly, I go to the one, 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 go to the opposite side, and this will be the most highly stressed slip <coughs> plane. And notice that this and this make an angle of 90 degrees. So 101 dotted with bar 111 is zero. Okay? So this is known as Deal's rule, an easy way of identifying which slip system will be most highly stressed. Okay, it's a complication. Okay? Supposing I start uh, with my tensile axis here, and I start to deform the crystal then the tensile axis will move towards the slip direction because F is equal, F dashed is equal to F plus S, alpha S, right? So I start with my tensile axis along this direction, but it's going to move towards the slip direction. So it follows this path here. But when you get to this boundary, you will have two slip systems equally stressed. Okay? So if my tensile axis lies on this boundary, then there will be two slip systems equally stressed because I can put my tensile axis slightly into this triangle, I'll find one slip system, slightly into this triangle, I'll find another slip system. So on a boundary, you will have two slip systems equally stressed. What is the consequence of that? So supposing we have only one slip system uh, stressed. Oops. Okay, I don't think I'm going to be able to write on this. Nope. So when I pull a single crystal and it's slipping on just one plane, how would you expect the stress strain curve to be different? if it's slipping on two different planes. Hmm? Yeah. Um, so will it be harder to deform or easier to deform when you have two? So that's not right, but why isn't it right? How does a material work harden? Yeah, so if you've got dislocations moving on one plane, 
they can just glide out and leave a step, right? But if they are interfering with each other, you get tangles, multiplication, and so on. So suddenly, instead of what's known as easy glide, where basically you get deformation without any work hardening, as soon as you start deforming two slip systems, you get sharp work hardening. Okay, so the stress rises rapidly. Now, once you are on this edge, why have I drawn the arrow moving towards this direction here? Because it should really move towards the slip direction, right? And the slip direction is not a 1, 1, 2. So we've got two slip systems operating here. Well, it's got to move towards the average of the two slip directions, right? So if I add this, uh, sorry, if I, that, my, that is going to be the slip direction for one of them, and that is going to be the slip direction for the other, and therefore if I add these two up, I get a 1, 1, 2, okay? So it's moving towards the average of the two slip directions. Now what happens if I continue deformation beyond this point and I hit this point here? I will have many slip systems operating. Look, one, two, three, four, five, six. So you get intense work hardening, okay? Now, in reality, you will never get two slip systems exactly equally stressed. I mean, that is very, very unlikely. But the point is that initially you might have just one slip system highly stressed and then you will get complexity as more and more slip systems start to contribute. Now, are you aware that in a polycrystalline material you cannot get ductility unless there are five slip systems operating in each crystal, at least five slip systems? Are you aware of that? So in a polycrystalline material, you know, when one grain deforms, the other grain has to match that deformation, right? If it doesn't, then you create a hole. So the reason why we need five slip systems is to produce an arbitrary change in shape. You need five independent slip systems, okay? Arbitrary means if I change a square into a circle, yeah, I can do that if I have five different slip systems. So if one crystal is deforming and produces a shape change, the other one has to replicate that shape change, the neighboring one, otherwise you get a hole. Okay. So if you do not have five independent slip systems, you will not get ductility in a polycrystalline material. Can you give me an example of such a material? Yeah, sorry to go back to magnesium, but it has a lot of problems, okay? So the basic slip system is the basal plane and there are three directions within the basal plane. If you apply s stress, actually, you can get other slip systems operating in magnesium and you can also get mechanical twinning taking over. So it has some ductility, but in most hexagonal metals, you are limited in ductility because of the lack of slip systems. As in a cubic material, you have 24 slip systems. Yeah. Okay, everyone happy with that? Right, so uh, this is just to illustrate what I said earlier, that when we do an experiment, we actually keep the tensile axis constant. So instead of the force axis rotating, it's the crystal itself which rotates. And that applies to most experiments we do, which involve plasticity, that we have constraint. So when we are doing rolling deformation, you know, the rolling mill can't rotate, yeah? So the crystals inside your uh, rolled plate will rotate. And the consequence of that is that even if you have a polycrystalline material which starts off with a random distribution of crystals, they will tend to align, okay? So the slip planes will rotate so that they are parallel to, say, the rolling plane, and the slip directions will rotate and so on. So even if you start off with a random distribution of crystals, they will tend to align. 
that we call texture. Okay? When there's a non-random distribution of crystals in your material, that is called texture. So a textured material is a bit like a single crystal and a bit like a polycrystal. They're not exactly aligned, they never are, and they're not random either. Uh, this, incidentally, is a picture I took at Sandwick, uh, which is a rolling mill, okay? but for making incredibly thin bits of stainless steel for shaving. Yeah. In order to do that, you've got to have very accurate rolls, right? But these are very, very small diameter. So if you just have these rolls, then they would deflect. So you have a whole bunch of rolls backing up this to maintain the dimensional accuracy without deflection. Okay. So this is a, a small mill, but very important in producing the shaving tools that we use more or less every day, right? Okay, so um, just uh, let me go back. The, the, this is uh, the rolling direction, the transverse direction, and the direction normal to the plane of the strip that we are rolling. And we often use these axes in plotting uh, crystallographic texture. So a non-random distribution of crystal orientations in a poly polycrystalline sample is said to be textured. And texture can arise not just from deformation, but also, for example, if you transform the material under magnetic field, yeah, or do anything which will impose uh, constraints on the orientations of the crystals. Now, this I claim, uh, so I'm plotting here a stereographic projection with the rolling direction, the transverse direction, and the normal direction. And on this, I'm plotting the 100 zero zero poles of individual crystals. Okay? So let's say I measure the orientation of one crystal relative to the rolling direction, transverse direction, and normal direction, and I plot over here one, two, and three 100 zero zero poles. Then I measure another one and I plot another three poles. And I do that for thousands of crystals. This then is called a pole figure, a one zero zero pole figure, plotted relative to the rolling direction, transverse direction, and normal direction. And I claim that is random, yeah? Does that look random to you? How come? I mean, isn't there a lot more here than at the edge? So is that random? Well, don't forget that angles are more concentrated in the middle than at the edge, okay? And that's why it looks non-random, but actually this is a random distribution of, uh, of poles. And this is produced by calculation because it's very, very difficult to get a material which has a random distribution of crystals in real life because you will have done something to it and therefore it will inherit the texture and when you heat it up again to produce austenite, the austenite will inherit the texture of the ferrite. When the austenite transforms again, the ferrite will inherit the texture of the austenite. So once you've got texture in your material, it's very difficult to get rid of it. Okay? Right. In contrast, this is a material which has been deformed and heat treated and so forth. And you can see that there is a huge clustering of poles. And this particular kind of texture is called a cube texture because the crystals are tending to align their 100 type directions along the rolling direction, normal direction, and transverse direction. Okay. So it will be very clear when you have texture because you will see clustering of poles along particular directions. So this is a cube texture. And there are, there are various other names for different distributions of poles, but the point is that it's a non-random distribution of poles. There is, just, uh, there is a weakness in this kind of presentation, and that is that this pole is perhaps related to this pole and this pole, the three one zero zero poles from each crystal. Yeah? But when I have a lot of data, I don't really know which crystal is next to its neighbor. One crystal could be located in this corner and in this corner, so we don't know the, where these crystals are actually located inside the sample. 
No, we do, no do we know that this particular pole comes from this and this. Yeah? So it's an overall impression of texture. Okay, why have I put this? Right. Okay, yeah. So thi this is uh, our pole figure. <laughs> and instead of using a whole stereographic projection, we have, you know, 24 different stereographic triangles and frequently people only present one such triangle and you c if you have that information you can reproduce all the entire stereogram. I myself prefer to look at the whole stereogram, it's not much, uh, I, I think it's much more visually clear what kind of texture it is and sometimes instead of plotting poles you plot contours of pole density on your stereographic, so you see contours like that, okay? So here we are plotting poles with respect to the sample axes. An inverse pole figure does the opposite, that you plot the rolling direction, transverse direction, and normal direction relative to the crystal axes. So if I take a crystal and I find where the rolling direction, etc., are, then I plot those on my stereographic projection where these axes would be 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. Take another crystal, where are the rolling directions, etc. plot those on, on there. And that's called the inverse pole figure. And here, uh, this is just to show you the contours, that's all. But now we are plotting relative to crystal axes, the deformation directions, okay? So that's simply an inverse pole figure. Everyone happy with? All that? Okay. So when you take your EBSD map and the machine gives you the information, that's usually an inverse pole figure because it's plotting the orientations of the crystals. Um, uh, it's plotting s your sample axes with respect to the crystal orientations. Okay, nothing, nothing new. Right, uh, so going back to EBSD, uh, how do we actually get the information uh, of the crystal orientation in a scanning electron microscope. Well, you know that in a scanning electron microscope, the beam is actually rocking like this, right? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's um, yeah, basically doing that on a very small distance, but it's rocking. And imagine that you have a sample and there's a set of crystal planes here. Then at certain orientations, you will get Bragg diffraction into your sample. Yeah. At other orientations, you will not. So in these particular orientations of the rocking beam, you will not pick up intensity in your detector. So there will appear dark lines corresponding to the points where you get Bragg diffraction into the sample because the beams which go into the sample don't make it into the detector, right? And those are called channeling patterns. They look like this, right? So everywhere where you've got a dark band, you've got diffraction going into your sample and therefore not being picked up by the detector. So by analyzing patterns like these, you know exactly or, or usually the accuracy is not very good, okay? People claim, you know, point two of a degree, but your specimen usually has strains in it and so forth. And I would say the accuracy is of the order of plus or minus three degrees uh, rather than the very high accuracy is claimed. So from that, you can get your data for crystal orientation and you can represent it in many different ways. The most common way, because it looks nice, is to assign a color to a particular location in the pole figure. So this particular orientation corresponds to somewhere here and so on. But in fact, you have absolutely all the data that you need in the files that go with these images. You know the orientation of every single crystal <coughs> and you know where they are located. You know that this and this are next to each other because you can see the image and you can get the orientation information of that and that. So this is extremely powerful technique for looking at texture, you not only have the texture, but you also have the micro uh, microstructure. 
So you know exactly that this grain is next to this grain, every bit of information. And unfortunately, like many modern techniques where you have all the information you need, most people do not actually make use of it at all. Okay? They're happy to get the color image and to show it. But there's a huge amount of information. If you measure a thousand crystals, you know absolutely the orientation and the neighborhood of each crystal. And there's a lot you can gain by doing more detailed analysis. Okay? So I, I will show you some methods of doing that late in later lectures. But don't throw away the information. And the same disease applies you know, to the atom probe, uh, where you can collect 10 million atoms in a few hours now, but you don't do anything with them. You produce a movie which shows you know, atom positions, and that's it. There's a lot more information on the structure of the solid solution that you get from the atom probe, which we should exploit or make available to somebody else to exploit. Okay? So it's a good thing to put all those data on the web. Right, so that's the moral philosophy for today, but let's carry on. Right, so here is a, a very recent example where EBSD made a huge difference. Okay? So this is a, a, a joint between two pieces of steel identical steel, it's a pipe, and the process by which this joint is made is induction heating. So the material inside this, uh, well, oops, so there's, uh, material here is actually the same as this, but you heat it up locally and you push the things together, that makes the joint. Okay, so it's a big production line. And for some reason, you know, the toughness along this joint is poor. And no matter how much work was done over a period of many years to find whether there are inclusions located at that interface or whether there is decarburization at the interface, nothing could explain that toughness. The microstructure was examined in both transmission microscopy and uh, optical microscopy, and you couldn't see any reason why the toughness along here should be poor. And you can see at the fusion line, I mean, there's virtually zero toughness, even though you cannot see any voids or defects at that fusion line, okay? Fusion line is the junction between the two bits of steel. You go away from there and, you know, you've got quite good toughness. So what is the reason of that, uh, reason for that? Well, this is not now the microstructure. So the grain size that you measure from microstructure is not the same as the grain size that you see on EBSD. Yeah? Because EBSD tells you crystallographic orientation. If several grains are more or less in the same orientation due to some kind of texture, then that's a big grain in EBSD. So you have to nowadays talk about microstructural grain size and crystallographic grain size. They are two different things. And crystallographic grain size is very important because you know, if you have a cleavage crack going across your material, it's interested in the crystallographic grain size, that means continuity of crystal planes, rather than the microstructural grain size. So in the optical microscope, everything looked with the same grain size. But look, as you get towards the fusion surface, you've got these large patches, yeah, which are all in roughly the same orientation. That means that a crack can propagate very easily across regions which are crystallographically homogeneous. And that is the reason for the very poor toughness. Now, once you've identified that reason, you've got to discover a way of getting rid of that large crystallographic grain size. And that's not easy. As I told you, there are memory effects that when you reverse the transformation because of the orientation relationship, you don't destroy the texture. Okay, So when you cool again, you again produce the same sort of grain distribution. So there are methods of doing this. I won't go into them today, but getting rid of texture is as important as creating texture in some applications. Okay. So when you're talking about toughness, we do not want large crystallographic grain size. Many, many studies now have reported this as the cause of poor toughness. Okay, so um, once you create a method of destroying that texture, and I'm not going to go into that now, you can actually get a recovery 
in toughness. It makes complete sense and when you look at the facet size on broken toughness specimens, you know the crystallographic facets, they correlate extremely well with the size of the large grains that you see in your EBSD images. So these are the facets, the crystallographic facets. Between these microstructural features, there is very little difference in crystallographic orientation. To make this crack deflect, deflect, you've got to have variation in orientation, okay? So there's a lot of information you can get from broken specimens to look at the facet size, compare with the crystallographic grain size, and then do experiments to get rid of large regions which have the same orientation. Okay. Now, I explained to you that there are weaknesses in this method, that we don't know, you know, where, where the poles from a particular crystal come from, okay? Uh, you know, if I have a pole, one zero zero pole here, then the second 100 pole could be here or somewhere here. I don't know that. So all this is showing you is that yes, there is texture and it tells you also the intensity of the texture. We need to do better and in order to do that, uh, I need to explain to you what an Euler angle is. Okay? So Euler angles are three angles which completely specify the orientation of a crystal relative to a frame of reference. So supposing I have a cube and on the three edges I have three angles going from node to whatever, then a dot inside that cube completely defines the ori uh, orientation of the crystal. Yeah, Because it's a three-dimensional plot, I, a dot will give me the three angles, right? Yeah, so it's a complete definition. I don't have three poles. I have a single dot inside a cube with three Euler angles at the edges. So let me uh, first of all explain in terms of this complicated diagram and then show you a very simple way of remembering. So these are my two frames of reference. I've got uh, capital X, capital Y, and capital Z. So that could be a crystal. And small x, small y, and small z the frame of reference like the rolling direction, normal direction, etc. Now, uh, these here are called the nodal planes. That means they are the planes containing X and Y of the blue crystal and X and Y of the red frame. And where they intersect, we call a node. Yeah? So th this uh, terminology comes from planetary orbits. So if you have two orbits crossing each other, then the line defining those uh, that crossing point is called the node. So the first angle is defined by rotating this blue axis so that it coincides with the node. So that's the first Euler angle, alpha. When you've got to that point, you then rotate about this z axis to get gamma, and then finally you rotate about that to get beta. So let me go through that a little bit slowly. Now, I'm going to make the approximation that we've got a very, very small angle between the nodal planes here, okay, just to simplify things. So here you are. First, I rotate about this axis until I get uh, the x getting to the nodal point, okay? So that defines my first Euler angle alpha. Then I start to rotate about this axis to generate the second uh, until that point coincides, okay? Let me go back, yeah. That's my second uh, Euler angle beta, okay? And then I start to rotate about this axis. Oops. To get my third angle gamma here, okay? So with three uh, rotations, I completely define the orientation of one frame of reference with respect to the other. And here is my cube that I was talking about, where a single dot represents the orientation of one crystal because alpha, beta, gamma are defined. 
and here's another crystal and another crystal and another crystal. So then I measure the orientations of thousands of crystals, plot them in here, it becomes very difficult to see, right? Because you'll get overlapping information. It's a three-dimensional cube, so you take sections of that cube. And this is called an orientation distribution function because now you know exactly the orientation of a particular crystal relative to another crystal. Okay? So we know exactly the relationship between this and this or this and this and so on. Uh, and we usually take sections of that cube along particular uh, values of the Euler angles which are of interest to us in texture and they will look like this. These are several sections taken at various values of phi, one of the Euler angles. Okay? And these contours are simply representing the densities of those points. So you might have seen these in the literature. They are called orientation distribution functions and is a much more general way of representing texture with more information than in stereographic projections. Th this uh, stereographic projections can be generated from these. Okay? So it's a subset, if you like, stereographic pole figures are a subset of orientation distribution functions. Okay? That's it for today. Okay? <laughs>